Hi everyone, this is Matthew Cruz with Cotton Stock Investments. I'm filling in for Marlon Bowling this week who's out on vacation. So before we get started, I want to remind everyone to like, share, subscribe this video. That helps us get these videos out there and you'll be uh, the first to know when we have a new episode come out. So uh, getting started today, I have Justin McKinney with us uh, from Rochester, Minnesota, Joe Camp from Bloomington, Illinois. How are you guys doing today? Good. Happy May Doing all right. Good deal. So uh, jumping right into it, let's maybe talk about the planting progress. Uh, we've obviously had quite a bit of rainfall here in the last several days. I think on our farm in Northwest Iowa, I've probably gotten two and a half inches since we got done uh, planting on my farm last week. So overall, our family farm is probably only halfway done. And it looks like we're going to be out of the field for the wild. Um, what do you guys seeing out there talking to customers well from from my perspective we got really good running southeast and southern minnesota last week again brakes screeching halting halting on anything going on this week just pretty cold pretty wet um you know probably most guys are sitting in that 50 percent planted uh in the south southern part of the state hopefully we can knock that out going into next week but we're going to need to see some better weather rain forecasted again for tomorrow night so it, it'll probably be the weekend or early next week before we see anything moving up here illinois is, is really variable i feel like it's a lot like uh, the rest of the country uh, where you've got one half uh, where there's a lot done you get down into the southern half of the state and they're progressing i guess we should split that too into east and west where uh, west western illinois Got quite a bit of progress here, but anything it feels like north of me, whether it's west or east, has been uh, delayed here. And, and farmers sitting around a sunny day today, but everybody's waiting for more rain to come here, uh, potentially later this evening and, and into the weekend. So it's a stop and start kind of thing and, and really variable. You yeah, depending on who you talk to, not just here, but those the same farmers we talked to in the Western Corn Belt, they're on into Indiana, they're really soggy. Uh, so it's just all over the place. And everybody says, well, I'm not, not really worried yet. It's, it's only May 1st, but uh, a couple of weeks from now, if, if we're still dealing with this, I'll be a little bit more frustrated is kind of the attitude. Yeah, we ended, I think on Friday with uh, overall corn planting progress was at like 27%, something like that, which was a few percentage points ahead of the curve. Um, but it seems to me like we haven't gotten hardly anything done, at least in Iowa, most Illinois, Missouri, places like that, Kansas, uh, with they've gotten a, a tremendous amount of precipitation. So is it possible that we can go from being ahead of the curve to behind the curve here in a short amount of time um, to the point where it could begin to kind of provide some support to the markets? And Justin, before uh, this video, you and I were kind of talking about that, how, you know, in 2019, we planted a month late or more in a lot of areas, and we saw a pretty big spike to the market. Now, ultimately, it, it came back down, and it didn't seem to affect production near as much as what people thought. But uh, at least for a, 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 you know, three or four week period there in 2019, you know, prices rallied pretty sharply when, um, you know, when it became clear that the crop was going to be delayed. Yeah. And as we talked earlier about that 2019, we did see that correction in the market move significantly higher, buck 20, buck 30, uh, without looking back at a chart exactly. But we, we did trade that market higher. Ultimately, we did get those acres planted. Now, fast forward, they ended up making stocks revisions in 2020, or excuse me, 2020 on that crop. So, uh, the possibility to revise stocks lower is still there, but once it's in the ground, it could be tough to, you know, mitigate the just planting pace. Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, only again that it's May 1st, but you fast forward a couple of weeks from now. That's uh, one thing I highlighted in the Comstock report last Friday was uh, how we get past mid-May and then we're going to think more about prevent plant potentially in areas, but uh, maybe more importantly, just general yield penalties as we would push that later planted stuff into uh, potentially late May or June. But yeah, for now, it's just looking ahead and, and trying to grasp on what the market might be talking about, even if it's not a huge deal right now, not a, a, an overly 
significant alarm. And well, we can talk about that, and it has the setup for that 2019 move. Ultimately, we're still sitting on 2 billion bushels of corn that are not going to get used this year. So the, the funds are still relatively large, largely short. They have a cushion in that stocks report that we're not going to use this year. We're going to carry into next year. And until we see something chisel away at that, I, I think you're going to see rallies get sold. Well, I think the big news for today that you're reading in a lot of places is that the EPA came out with their new GREET model, uh, which we've been, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people have been waiting for this to come out right, where they're supposed to define what the actual um, process is to identify your carbon intensity score on the farm and things like that. And um, I don't know if you guys have a chance to review that much, but what your kind of feedback on that is. Uh, what, what was your initial impressions of that? Well, in, in my viewpoint, un, it was not unexpected. It didn't really tell us anything. It told us what we needed to be on the 22, 23 crop going into this year in, and even 24. But if we're looking at this renewable aviation fuel, sustainable aviation fuel, this is going to be a long process to get the models, the tax credits, and this all lined up and documented. I still struggle to see, you know, some areas where the no-till, the cover crop, the fertilizer, um, things like that, it could be tough to implement as you move north. Those cover crops can be kind of tough. Uh, you know, you get up into Minnesota, you just don't have the growing season. So I still think it needs to be tweaked. I was a little disappointed we didn't get a better direction moving forward. But that was my take on it. Joe, what were your thoughts? In part, a, a sort of another kick the can down the road type uh, set of guidance because it does set out some of these requirements through the end of this year. Uh, but there's still now the uh, biofuel program for next year and beyond where we could put, get those potential revisions to the model again. And so it's more uncertainty, unfortunate. If anything, it was disappointing like you say, Justin, for individuals that, that might not be able to meet the needs here right away. Um, but overall, you know, it's not anything to take away from uh, the upside that could be in the future in terms of more demand for our crops uh, within this nascent sustainable aviation fuel uh, industry. So, you know, there's some positives to take uh, uh, still on the overall the overall conversation of processing demand and sustainable jet fuel, uh, but something like this, another kind of disappointing uh, lack of certainty has stirred up by, by government guidance that was long delayed and, and now will be again in the future, unfortunately. My take from it was that it just kind of ended in a dud that the, the we've been waiting for so long for some clear definition on a path forward and with the hope that this was going to create more corn demand and ultimately it doesn't seem like we should expect much of anything there that they they kind of went with a one size fit all that that uh maybe there's one or two things out of those those three step programs right that that farmers could choose from or that that maybe they were doing one of them but it sounds like you got to be doing all three you got to be doing the no till the cover crops the nitrogen use efficiency to be able to um tap into that that market and so i think you're going to find a lot of people are going to be disappointed in that um and i don't think that it ultimately it's going to move the the corn consumption needle which is what people were looking forward to that was a big part of this but uh it also just kind of joe like you alluded to it seems like it kicks the can down the road right that uh you know brazil and our competitors have already positioned themselves uh to kind of be the the, the go-to uh supplier for this sustainable aviation fuel and uh and we just haven't made any progress on that front and so we're we're going to continue to kind of um fall back into second or third place here so my default on that also matthew was the that is the the guideline for corn going into an ethanol plant that may produce sustainable aviation fuel now you look around the map there's very few plants that are producing sustainable you know i believe there's one in georgia using brazilian sugarcane ethanol correct but you look at the map and there's a huge amount of cost and investment and research it's going to need to be done 
on the cover crop side, if you're actually going to move it north to implement this, that's going to have to, you know, be paid for somehow, either incentivize the farmers or, you know, through the ethanol kickbacks or whatever. But there's a lot of loopholes here. And if you look at the northern part of the belt, a lot of this carbon scoring is based on your yield, right? And you get to an area that, you know, maybe grows 130 bushel corn, 140, 150 bushel corn, not like your, you know, Clay County, Iowa, 250 bushels on a bad year. Uh, it's going to be tough for those areas. So there's a lot of missing or moving parts in this. I was disappointed overall based on the fact that this was set to come out at the Commodity Classic. It was postponed. I thought, well, maybe being postponed, we'll get a little more definition. We did not. The uh, Federal Reserve meeting that I think is going to take place this afternoon, is that right? Uh, we're going to get more of an, an update from Jerome Powell on the direction of interest rates and, and inflation. Um, you know, it's, we're, I'm a little bit concerned that sounds like we're entering into a period of stagflation where we continue to see stubbornly high interest rates along with, um, uh, in, in increase in inflation. What, what do you guys see there? How do you see that impacting the markets? So far, the market seems to be cheering on, uh, this wrapping up of the fed meeting here today. So the metals rallying the dollar index leveling off stocks rebounding here into the uh, last couple hours of trade and that would be because while there was no rate change as expected here this month uh, there is still the guidance from the central bank that there can be a interest rate reduction yet by the end of the calendar year and so that kind of walks the line of recognizing that inflation is still burdensome but the fed doesn't want to break the market either and uh, give up what is noticed as relatively strong enough economic performance to this period that has led them to be more hawkish to date. So they're kind of trying to play it both ways and say, no interest rate reduction uh, here right away, probably not in June, uh, but by the end of the year, we can still be at a point where we uh, start to move lower. And, and that's enough for, again, some of these markets to feel relief on it, at least for now. If I had anything to add on that, I would be, you know, Joel, you follow this really closely, but I would be very surprised to see a rate cut by the end of the year. I just don't see where, I think the Fed's in a pickle. They, they you know, we can't raise rates. We can't cut rates. Uh, I think we just chop sideways on that again. We've made all-time highs here in, in gold recently. Do you think that that trend is set to continue because of that if, if inflation is here to stay because usually um, investors like to buy gold as a um, you know to offset the risk of inflation joe what do you think about that gold can uh, you know be bullish on both fronts whereas inflation is still high that's positive for gold but also the fed wants to keep promising a, a an eventual rate cut and that's friendly for gold and so uh, you continue to have uh, central banks buy up gold or there's all of a sudden more interest from investors like you mentioned to hedge inflation that continues to be high uh, you know more attention on the retail level as it does break out to new all-time highs so it looks like it's still got a bit under it and, and it does right now okay well, we're wrapping up uh justin maybe tell us what's going on with uh, livestock right now it looks like we've been giving up ground here in the hogs here lately um a little bit of bump in the life in the cattle. Um, where do you see the markets going from here? You know, that uncertainty we've talked about it. I know Joe's typed or wrote about it in the Comstock report as well as, as I have too. You know, we, we know the market doesn't like uncertainty. We have bird flu now. Okay. We had bird flu and cattle. We continue to add these layers of uncertainty. Now we're testing uh, the meat of dairy cattle in stores or, or excuse me, of cattle in store to see if it has bird flu in it. Again, another uncertainty. We continue to, to just hammer this cattle market lower. The numbers still aren't there. The weights are higher, which has eased it up, eased some of the pressure. But ultimately, those boxes continue to fail. We were closed. Midday was weaker again today. Choices in that 293. Um, as I wrote in the Comstock report earlier this week, I feel like it's now or never on the boxes. If we can't get above that $300 level, I probably need to 
lower our sights a little bit. But moving over to the Hogs, they had a good run. We've set back off of that fun position as of last Friday was within earshot of a record long. We're hearing a lot of disease issues going around, and possibly that's what we got the funds to get long to start with. But I still feel like there may be a little bit in that hog market yet. We're, we're down around support levels, slightly under on the June. And we look at the fourth quarter, I feel like we're probably just a little bit undervalued, but those fourth quarter hogs are always tough to make money on. So keep an eye out there for a level that works in your operation and maybe get some orders working on that. You know, the livestock, like any market, are going to be separated between, you know, the supply and demand for the futures and how speculators can get spooked by all of this uh, news that's off and on. At the end of the day, there's also the physical out there, and we feel like supply, as mentioned, relatively tight for both markets. We're heading into the summer season uh, at, a, at a much lower level than usual for both pork and beef stocks. I don't see demand slowing down anytime right away here. And uh, we know the supply side, uh, as tight as it has been for cattle, uh, we're only going to tighten production further for hogs into the rest of the year. So that, that should allow us to get past some of these knee jerk sell offs like we observed again today and, and maybe back to reality eventually with uh, more friendly fundamentals. All right. Well, thank you guys for, for joining us. And uh, well, that'll be it for this episode. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget, you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.